Okay, let's get started here. Welcome to day four of SCLO's first maybe annual Maker Week uh, <laughs> events. We have a series of talks that have been happening in the evening. Some of you may have seen them. And tonight we are focusing on impacts of uh, digital technologies in industry. We have a panel here and we have Brian Foy, raise your hand here. On the end, he's with Lockheed Martin and he's an advanced manufacturing program manager. Andrew Trexler, right over here, works with word processing services and he's a 3D printing specialist. Uh, we have Tim Simpson, who is the co-director of the CIMP Center, which stands for the Center for Innovative Materials Processing for Direct Deposition of Metal. Digital Deposition. <laughs> Digital yeah, Deposition right. Metal <laughs> Printing. Blah, blah, blah. 3D. And, and, blah, blah, blah. and Tim's a professor <laughs> at Penn State in the, uh, in the engineering department. And we also have Victor DiDonato. He's the UPS manager here in State College and uh, for Altoona. And we're lucky enough to have one of 50, uh, 50? 52, 50, yeah. 52 locations where UPS actually is doing 3D printing. So we're pretty fortunate to have that here. So first we'll start off, I think, what we'll go around the room. And each one of you give a, give a little bit about what you do and your impacts. And then we'll have some audience questions uh, for our panel, which they will oh, no, field like handily. <laughs> And we should start with Mr. I, Simpson. I, I pulled this one together, so I'll start. So yeah. uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, Tim Simpson. So as Dave said, I'm a professor in mechanical engineering and industrial engineering. And the uh, role here tonight is I'm actually co-director on SIMP3D. So it is a metal, 3D metal printing lab. And so we actually are funded by uh, DARPA, so the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency that <laughs> helped cooked up the internet and uh, GPS and all that sort of stuff. They're trying to reinvest in uh, make sure that the military can still make airplanes and tanks and that sort of stuff, so manufacturing is very important to them. And so we are their demonstration facility for added manufacturing. And so sort of part of our role, our mission, if you will, is to work with companies like a Lockheed or a Boeing or uh, other contractors or even service branches, uh, the, the Army, Navy, Marines, as the case may be, and try and find out when and where and how should 3D printing support uh, the parts that they make, the services they provide, uh, when they're out on the ocean and a uh, plane can't fly because a part breaks or a ship can't go, should they be 3D printing these parts, you know, versus having carrying a bunch of parts around on inventory and those sorts of things. Um, so we get to print uh, all sorts of things. Uh, we've got a variety of, of metal 3D printers over there uh, that sort of do small, little, actually I got, a, I got a few demos in here I'll bring out. Maybe can pass these around a little bit, so small little uh, sort of lattice structures and uh, have actually printed uh, 3D titanium hip implants uh, that are FDA certified that could end up in your hip or there's folks that do uh, knees and joints and all that sort of stuff to uh, another, let's see, slightly bigger part here, Dave, pass that around. This actually is a, um, goes on, it's a titanium part uh, for a, uh, the student race car team here. So actually students designed and 3D printed that out of a single piece of titanium that now would get bolted onto the car if we didn't have it around for show and tell all the time. Uh, but we're basically printing parts that now go into your hip, onto your car, onto your airplane, on your ship, uh, or fly into space as the case may be. So pretty exciting times. And um, thanks for being here. Hey. Uh, well, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for, for having us, Tim. Uh, I'm Brian Foy, I'm with Lockheed Martin. I, uh, I manage our uh, corporate uh, advanced manufacturing initiative, uh, of which 3D printing is a big piece uh, uh, across the corporation within Lockheed Martin. Uh, you know, as a company, we've been involved with 3D printing in various capacities for, you know, 20 plus years. Uh, and that, that may be surprising to some folks, but the, the technology is not terribly new. Um, what, what's happened recently is, is a handful of patents have expired, and you've seen the, this explosion of, of new people entering the market and, and trying to rapidly mature technology and, and costs come down particularly with desktop systems. And so we're, we're kind of riding this hype cycle right now where uh, 3D printing is getting a lot of press and we're kind of finally saying, hey, it's about time. This has been a, a really unique opportunity for us as a company. Um, I think most, again, I think most people may be familiar with desktop type 3D printers, think MakerBots, things like that. Um, and, and there's value there for a company like Lockheed Martin when it comes to, to rapid prototyping and, and scale size models and things like that. But, uh, you know, perhaps uh, what people don't realize is that we're also looking into uh, 
very big tooling, that's a big application space for us at Lockheed Martin. If you can think when you're building a, a fighter aircraft, for example, right, the, 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 the plane's got lots of funny contours, and you need to build you know, effectively tools that are the negative of those contours. And historically, the way you do that is very, you know, very high precision machining, um, and it gets, uh, uh, it's very expensive, it's very time intensive, et cetera. And so we, we, we actually have right now on the F-35 program, it's a Joint Strike Fighter, one of the fifth generation uh, fighter aircraft that's currently under development. On the production line there, we have over 5,000 tools and jigs that have been 3D printed. And these are, some of them are very large, some of them are very small. But uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's a little known fact that, that people may not know about Lockheed and how we're using 3D printing. <coughs> Um, additionally, you know, perhaps the last space that we're getting into, also because it's the hardest, is, uh, is actual production parts, parts that we would actually deliver to our end customers that are 3D printed. And primarily the reason is, in aerospace and defense, it's a very high reliability product that we have to deliver. We have to know exactly what the material properties are. We need to know it can't fail in the environment that we put it in. Otherwise, somebody's life might, might be in danger. And so uh, we're still in the nascent stages here of of maturing our reliability of, of 3D printing processes and qualifying the end result. And so we are also putting our, our, you know, leaning in a little bit and trying to figure out how can we qualify parts that we can use on our finished systems and our platforms. Uh, another interesting factoid is that uh, I think we were the first company to get 3D printed parts into space. Um, you may have heard some of the hype recently about 3D printers in space in the International Space Station. Awesome. Uh, we launched uh, some, some brackets on uh, the Juno spacecraft, uh, it, which is currently headed to Jupiter. And we'll be entering orbit there, uh, I believe, sometime mid-2016. So this was launched a handful of years ago, and uh, just another nice uh, accomplishment here and, and, and a step to show you kind of where we're going with 3D printing. So, uh, you know, if I look across the company right now, I'd say we have over 200 3D printers uh, installed uh, within the U.S. across all of our Lockheed Martin facilities. A lot of them are desktop-type, you know, machines, but we've also got some very large machines, too. Uh, the, the center here, the SIMP 3D Center, had a, uh, recently had a, a machine that was capable of putting down you know, weld beads of titanium to additively build up large structure. Uh, we've made similar investments and uh, are trying to build large aircraft structure and large uh, spacecraft structure with some of these titanium weld bead type additive technologies. So, uh, you know, really a lot of really fascinating, interesting work going on at Lockheed. Uh, where we've had a wonderful partnership with Penn State and the SIMP 3D Center. Uh, over the past handful of years and looking forward to continuing to do that. I think you guys have one of the premier uh, 3D printing labs within the country. So uh, this is really kind of a nice win-win uh, situation for both of us. So uh, happy to talk more, but I know we've got a whole panel here. So <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, Victor DiNato with the uh, UPS store. I'm across from Wegmans and State College and Altoona. Um, Penn State graduate uh, a few years back and um, stayed in the area. Our, our niche is small business customers, and we get so many questions fielded of why is the UPS store doing uh, 3D printing? Well, the answer is um, it's, it's new, it's exciting. And um, we can provide uh, kind of full circle uh, solutions to our customers. We do, we do pack and ship, as customers know, and we do mailboxes, and um, the 3D printing just offers that solution to the um, at-home inventor or tinker. Um, or even small, medium-sized businesses. Um, we've, we've been running jobs from um, you know, well-known companies um, and then just individuals. Um, you know, it's we, no two jobs are, are, are alike. We definitely get um, see a little just small gadgets. We see prototypes. Um, we have non-disclosures with some so some firms in town that um, you know we do uh, we did our parts for them, um, and we've really seen kind of a you know, increase um, kind of in the general public, kind of their just general interest. Um, we see that and we also see um, kind of real keen um, interest in how do I get this part to, um, from kind of concept to, to uh, reality. So um, we're, we're really excited. We've been, we're at right about a year right now. We've had the our 3D printer, we have a Stratasys, uh, SE Plus. We can do movable parts, um, arches um, with really high tolerances. And uh, well, probably one of the best things about it is just the reliability, the consistency. Um, we don't have to kind of mess with the printer too much, and we can count on it to kind of go from um, kind of desktop to, to solution. So um, we're really excited and we're happy to be on the panel here. My name is Andrew Trexler. I uh, work with WPS, or Word Processing Services. What we kind of do is basically we work for businesses to help them do better business. That's our slogan. And that's why we got into 3D printing, was because we understand that each business 
that is out there has their own fingerprint where each, you know, something they're good at or something's different from the next. 3D printing has actually proven itself in many different industries to, to fill that gap that they needed. For instance, uh, I have here a aortic heart valve where we, CT, we went into a hospital and took a CT scan and was able to help the cardiovascular surgeon find the problems with great precision and accuracy so that he could actually practice the surgery before doing the surgery. He was also able to use that print to fit a mechanical heart valve that was perfect for that individual. Typically, mechanical heart valves are mass produced in different sizes, kind of like shoes. But instead of having that shoe, he was able to get one perfectly for himself. And that's really what we've been trying to do is consult companies, find ways where they can utilize 3D printing to give them the competitive advantage against or a, a juxtaposed to their competitors. So I have, thank you. Okay, we have a bunch of industry experts and we have some questions, I'm sure. Anybody have something burning that they would like to start off with? Yes, sir. I'm gonna pass the microphone around because we are recording this. <laughs> His hand went up too quick, I'm scared. This yeah. piece here? <laughs> yes. How do you bond molecularly while you're printing one little teeny I don't know what a bite at a time, a bit at a time. So that so that's made in a, uh, a powder bed system. So essentially, you start off with uh, a metallic powder, uh, very very small particle sizes. It's probably smaller than like fine grains of sand. Uh, and in that case, it's it's a titanium powder. And then you literally put one layer of it, and then use a laser in that case to melt the powder. You do another layer, repeat, another layer, repeat, another layer. And so you're additively building up layer by layer. So it's welding the powder it's every a, single it, yep, pass. Yep, it's essentially uh, welding it. Yep. And how long would it take to make this from the time you hit start? So that particular part right there took 54 hours to build. And so half, half of the time to build that, though, was the support structures that are needed to make sure that everything turns out okay. And there's good, there's good and there's bad to that. So it's, you know, a, a, basically a one-day build then you end up getting rid of uh, all those support structures. So it was about a $2,000 part, $2,000 of powder, of which uh, about a third of that, 15, or uh, uh, sorry, two thirds of that, $1,500 was supports that then get removed, cut off and ground. So and how is that removed? Uh, you get out a grinder or a hacksaw, and uh, so, you, so, okay. so you use this you know, high-tech 21st century laser powder and then you literally, as my as one of my staff says, go go caveman on it, and you're chiseling off uh, the supports. I mean, that's that's one of the big things that's different about metal and plastic. This, the plastic supports are actually water soluble, and so you can build them and then put it in a water bath or a solution, and the supports dissolve away. You can't quite do that with metal yet, so uh, yeah, you're grinding and chiseling them off. So the parts that have to be taken out can actually be powdered in, but much less densely. It, Yep, exactly. So it's easier to work. Exactly. It's easier to remove or even design them to sort of snap off or whatever the case may be. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges with those metal parts. Because this is heating and cooling and heating and cooling so quickly, again, you have this laser going back and forth, a high energy source, um, that the metal wants to, to sort of curl up like, like a potato chip. And so, so the supports are actually anchoring it down. You have a solid build plate. And so that thing is essentially welded to the build plate. Uh, and then you go back and forth on it like that. Again, that's different from the, uh, some of the plastic systems that are out there. You're actually, you're, you're, the supports are fighting gravity. In this case, the supports are actually anchoring it down so it doesn't warp up. So if this is, I don't know what this hole is for in the yep. center, but if this is a bearing surface, let's say, like a connecting rod, you could transmit the data for a connecting rod, build the connecting rod, and then it would have to be machined still, correct? Possibly, yep, yep. And I think that's probably, again, one of the sort of the common misconceptions, uh, I don't know if we think MakerBot or not for it, that you just sort of hit print and the part goes and you're done, right? But particularly, again, for the metal stuff, you need to, uh, there's a lot of post-processing and machining, making sure your tolerance isn't fit. So as, as you heard from others, you know, it's one thing to do prototypes and fixtures and tooling, it's another to have a final part that has to mate and connect with something else and 
have these uh, reliability and fatigue properties. And so making sure that everything is machined and uh, exactly to your specifications is one of the sort of the challenges or hurdles of getting this technology more widely to market. And for instance, these mount holes here, mm -hmm. if they had a tapped thread, that would have to be tapped later? Some of them, yes. If the threads are, are big enough, you could actually 3D print the threads. Uh, but in most cases, you'd leave a little extra and, and then machine and tap, tap it, it later. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Good questions. So to follow up with the obvious question, why would you do this? What's the advantage? If you have to do all this post-processing and all of this machine work to have a precise mating, why would you do it? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. I'll swing at that one first if you want. Um, it's a great question, and I think there's, there's also another misconception that if you, if you print it, it's better. And that, that's not always the case. I think what we're discovering with 3D printing is that it's, it's another tool in the toolbox. It's not going to replace machining, it's not going to replace uh, other production methods, but it's an, it does give you some unique capabilities. Particularly, complexity is free with 3D printing. You can, you can, I mean, the lattice structure that Tim just passed out here, you can't machine that. Uh, you can't create a metal structure with that kind of strength. Uh, any other way than, than printing it. So there are some very unique opportunities to look at some traditional designs and ask yourself, how can I redesign this? You know, perhaps in a much more complex way, but it's not going to cause me any more you know, pain to print it out. Um, so that's, that's one reason why. What we're actually finding too is uh, a really good business case for 3D printing, particularly metal parts, is, is when you compare to how is that part produced today. Forgings, for example, can be a, uh, a great example. Uh, sometimes for very large forgings, lead times can be on the order of, you know, a year plus. Um, and if, you, if it takes 50 hours or 80 hours of, of build time to print a large part, that you then have to go post machine. Well, guess what? You generally have to post machine a forging anyway, too. And so in our, in our business, time is money. And if you can do, you know, in a period, you know, in a period of a couple of weeks, what it would take to procure a forging and then do all the post machining, which might take a couple of years, you've got an incredible business case. But again, that's a bit of a niche business case. And so what we're trying to do as a company is figure out where is this unique tool set really well you know, adapted to, to and has a really high value business case. And what we're also trying to do is make sure that we, we don't use 3D printing where it simply doesn't make sense because there are plenty of scenarios where it doesn't. Uh, as Tim mentioned before, that powder, for example, is very expensive. <laughs> yeah, 3D printing can be a very expensive alternative. Um, so there, there are these niche application spaces where the business case really works out well. So I'll, I'll piggyback on that. So the, the complexity is free. And so one of the other th advantages is light, light weighting components. And so particularly in aerospace, engines, aircraft, the light, you know, the more weight you got to fly around, the more fuel you consume, the more expensive and those sorts of things. And so this is an example. This is a bracket of GE. Uh, so General Electric had this bracket challenge two summers ago now. And so they worked with a company called GrabCAD, so G-R-A-B, CAD. Uh, they're basically an online repository for, uh, for CAD models and 3D files. And they said, uh, we'll pass this one around. So this is the current bracket design. So it's made from a subtractive process. Imagine basically a block of metal. We didn't, it's a very expensive block of metal, so we printed it out of plastic. But imagine, you know, that part is essentially just machine, you know, machine away the material that you don't need and you've got the finished part. And I believe that bracket weighs about four and a half pounds out of uh, uh, the metal that is made. There's four of them that mount. They posted that design online and said, here's the bolt patterns, here's the connection points, here's the forces that it needs to support, give us a better design. And so within about three months, uh, 700 people from around the world submitted designs, crazy designs that look like, we got two of them here, uh, that we also printed out, that are very sort of uh, lightweight structures that essentially have the same interfaces, hold the same loads, yet weigh a fraction of what the current bracket is. And so again, to that point of you're, you're creating the complexity, you know, it's, it's no more expensive, say, to print that part than that other one, yet now that part weighs uh, less, less than a pound. The, uh, the winner, in fact, was a 15, 16 year old kid from Indonesia that uh, his final design was like uh, point, points to three quarters of a pound, reduced the weight by about 84% and uh, got 10,000 bucks and apparently a job from GE. So not a bad, not a bad competition. <laughs> Yeah, two other areas that, that have often been uh, related to or inspired 3D printing. One is uh, tremendous weight savings, especially if you have hidden 
or almost molecular style cavities. So in these, even you're seeing what's happening, but if you look at the wings of a bird and they're very porous and very lightweight, that's one other possibility. And especially when you have very limited run specialty items. So if you have something that, you know, to make a casting, there's a tremendous amount of cost involved in that, but you're only making four of them or 10 of them. 3D printing becomes a really good alternative, even though there is some post-processing still involved. Does anybody have any other questions here? <coughs> yes, sir. Greg. Yeah. So what's your main focus out there at the Sense Lab anyway? Is it developing the process or the, or the, the machines themselves or both? Or? We, we end up doing a little all the above. Uh, I think, again, as, as Brian and others were saying, this, you know, the, the technology has been around for a lot of years, but in terms of actually advancing it and deploying it right now, how you're designing, how you're making, how you're qualifying and certifying is sort of all up in the air right now. So yes, we are looking at sort of more process improvements, uh, sort of real-time sensing, monitoring, sort of feedback stuff to the, 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 the verification and validation of the process, what happens on the backside in terms of inspection and certification, and then how are you designing crazy lattice structures like that? And from an engineering perspective, what are my engineering tools to actually analyze that part to see if it, you know, can support the weights that I that I thought it did. So, yeah. so the actual machines you're, that uh, that you're using though are they're they're manufactured by someone else, and then you're some some uh, are, and we built our own as well. So, so, so you built some from yep. scratch, and then you've also yep. you're uh, using other ones that you're like maybe modifying or something or correct enhancing. Yeah. After they go off warranty, then we quickly take them apart and, uh, <laughs> and do some modifications. So no, we've got uh, four or five systems. Uh, that are there that we've purchased um, and are doing mods to and then we've got a couple of our own systems that uh, the Applied Research Lab, so as a partner with us, lead on the center and they've, they've built systems for, for laser deposition that we've been using as well. So, Okay, and I had one other question too. Um, sure. Are, uh, and, uh, this is open for anybody, I guess, um, but uh, are, is there uh, any uh, work research going on in um, other thermoplastics that would be uh, you know, stronger or better than uh, than the materials that are being used right now. I mean, I see like there's just a handful of common materials that are being used now, but there's other thermoplastics out there that are are much better, um, but they're maybe not suitable for 3D printing. So, um, is there any work going on in that area, like to to you know create new thermoplastics that would be you know better? So, I mean, as far as desk job or desk um, top uh, 3D printers, they're, I was at an expo and they're already putting filaments of metal in those to make them stronger um, or have more tensile strength, what have you. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not an expert in engineering, but I know the fact that you know, metals are, have certain properties that are better than the plastics, so hence the direction of that. But they are manipulating some of the plastics to have uh, metallic-like properties. Um, and especially at home printers and, um, and desktop printers as well. So. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of like things going on with mixing things in filament yeah. too. You know, and, and that seems to be of dubious value sometimes. So. Yeah, there, there is some, some work going on here. We've, we're doing some materials development as well, and it's companies that are saying, we think we have a better material and let's print it and see what we can do with it. So I think that's everybody's sort of looking. I mean, we're, we're sort of, our, our hands are tied in some sense. You know, you buy these machines and yes. you, you, are, you are limited to their materials. You want to be able to sort of open it up and use your own thing, but you got to know then which knobs and dials to tweak appropriately to make sure it runs. So. And we are eagerly awaiting, you know, new materials <laughs> that we can adopt onto our platforms. Uh, uh, I mean, that's an expensive endeavor, certainly, and, but, but you're right, we're always looking for the next best material, but for us, it's really, you know, what kind of qualification data can we get? Can, is the process qualified? Can we, are the results reliable? And so, uh, we're eagerly awaiting a lot of the, the results coming out of the labs and America makes and other. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. sure you will see a lot of different plastics in the future with this. As more people use it, more people, uh, like myself, will try to shove anything through the nozzle to figure out if it works. <laughs> um, so I'm sure that that's going to advance. It's one of those things time will tell. So the mantra in 3D printing is stronger, faster, cheaper. And, you know, I, I think that before we're done here, it'd be great to speculate on what's preventing any one of those three categories to move forward. Uh, but I see some more questions. Well, that was actually going to be my question. Uh, um, I just want you to look, look into uh, crystal balls and 
and and just you know it, this can be way way uh, um, way off base but uh, um, see just give your ideas give, give us your ideas about how this will trickle down you hear kind of articles saying that you know for example, car dealerships won't have car parts anymore. They'll just have a, a fancy kind of uh, yeah. added printer and uh, <laughs> then your fender and then, you know, and the next day it's, it's ready and then in the, in the right color. So I think it's a little bit fanciful. Um, yeah. But, you know, 10, 20 years down the, down the road, uh, if you want to stick your necks out, so please go ahead. <laughs> I was going to I mean, if I may, I mean, I yeah. think that, that's probably the, I think the big, kind of picture is um, kind of uh, patents and kind of copyright and everything because um, if, if you need a part you know why why call your uh, make of your refrigerator a door to the part just if you can have any design skills or you can find it on the internet just download it and print it right so that's kind of a huge kind of uh, kind of open vacuum right now is how where the law sides on that um, but it's already happening I mean I know Jay Leno for uh, for car parts <laughs> for hundred you know ninety years ago um, you know where do you find the car part well you don't so it's, if you can three D print it and uh, as we touched on it's a uh, typically cheaper <coughs> manufacturing process than just extruding from a chunk of metal um, especially if you're just doing a one off typically when you're running manufacturing you, you want to have you know, some kind of volume to uh, substantiate the cost so it's definitely already happening. Um, um, and if you just go on places like Thingiverse, you can see parts just for kind of anything and everything, toys, you name it. So. And if, yeah, I think that's a great example. I think you're absolutely right. And I think to, to extrapolate that one step further and perhaps even go a few more years out, uh, we're already seeing some beginning work on uh, what we call multifunction additive manufacturing, where you're no longer just trying to print structure. Now you're talking about how do you embed conductive traces or wiring. If you can do that, can you then 3D print motors? Can you then pick and place electronics and solder real time? So I think what, we're think what we'll see in the future, and this is not three years out, it's not five years out, it's, it's, it's very distant, but will be production cells that can create fully functional, you know, moving intelligent products. Especially, you know, if you think about the increases of robotics and automation, uh, the internet of things, I think that's the future we're working towards. Uh, we've actually got a, a, a cell we created at Lockheed Martin called the multi-robotic additive cluster. Now we try to build a lot of big things at Lockheed, so we've got some, you know, six degree of you know, six, six degree of freedom uh, robotic arms with extruders and cutting tools and things that can all they can print and uh, machine and inspect all at the same time. And I think that's where we're going to see some of this go uh, once we get our once we really get our arms around the the, the technology that we're we're pursuing today. We're going to start looking at these multifunction solutions to create these really highly functional parts and products uh, truly in the future. I saw another question. Yep. For the UPS guy, I'm kind of curious, someone walks into your store, what do they have to have? Uh, software? Where do you start? The machine uses a STL file, which is simply just a polygonal mesh um, with multi, you know, thousands, millions of points of, of data. Um, you know, we can help consult with designing if need be, um, but most of the customers we have already have a prototype in mind right. and have created it. There's open source CAD software, there's paid like SolidWorks and other, Rhino and others. Um, so we can do either or. Okay, thank you. I have a question from the other guys in the line. When the, that uh, item or the items came back from space or the International Space Station that was printed, uh, what were you know the results of those? They, I know they inspected them when they got back. How they turn out? You know. I you know I was I was I was actually talking to the made in space guys uh, a couple months ago uh, in uh, Long Beach, California, and um, you know so what they did was they they shipped the printer to the International Space Station. Right. And then, you know, as, as a demonstration piece, they sent a file up, right. uh, effectively for a wrench. Yes. It was the first yes. part, I believe. It was a little <laughs> adjustable wrench. And uh, I, I, believe, I believe the wrench worked, and it, oh. it, it turned the bolts it was supposed to turn. Huh? <laughs> so it was strong enough and... Yeah, you know, it was a I polymer wrench. It was, it was not a metal wrench. It was a lot more difficult, more complex doing it in space. Yeah, I mean, because actually one of, the, one, of the, one of the issues they, they shared was that, you know, when you've got gravity, you can have a lot of slop in your machine because gravity pulls everything down. And so when you're up in space, everything's kind of floating around. Your tolerances really are poor. And so they really had to dial everything in and kind of really invent a lot of their own technology there um, to, to really lock in the tolerances so they could do it in microgravity. Cool. And on your uh, subtractive printing, is that like a four axial printer or a mach toy machine? Or? Uh, 
How do you sort of your so robot? Just, oh, the robots. Oh, okay. the, the, the multi robot, yeah, the multi robotic additive cluster, I think we're calling it now. Um, uh, so, so we've got uh, a polymer extruder on, on one robot head uh, initially, and on the other robot head, we've got a cutting tool. And what we're, uh, well, I. I'll, I'll foreshadow a little bit. We're also looking ahead to how can we do tool changes. So you can have different types of extruders, different types of machining tools, inspection tools on the robots. Um, that's kind of where we're, we're going with the technology. Can you cut out those supports as you go? Uh, yeah, if, if, if you need supports, right, yeah. So you just heard two different terms used, uh, subtractive and additive. And just to clarify that a little bit, when we're talking about 3D printing, in particular, that's an additive process. You're starting with nothing, and you're creating from that. So with nothing, you then build. But subtractive has been with us for centuries, wherein you start with a hunk of something, and you're carving away from it. This is the classic milling machine, lathes, even your drill. Uh, so when you, what we're doing is really redefining with these tools this method of creating from nothing to build up. up essentially. So um, to go back to this notion of faster, cheaper, stronger, what's the hold up? What, you know, we as consumers, what, what, where are the sticking points in this process? I mean, we, we now have these plastic printers and we can make things. When are we going to get metal ones? We're kind of, you know, we got a lot of really neat stuff we're making, but it's just not strong enough. No, I mean, it's interesting. So back to the, to the time horizon one to shadow this a little bit. I mean, we're, we're, we do a lot of work with the Navy and uh, the Admiral got it in his mind uh, a couple years ago that said by 2017, we'll have 3D printers on aircraft that will just print replacement parts and uh, thought that, yeah, with the MakerBot's one thing, but doing it out of metal is something entirely different. So uh, that's been good business for us because now the Navy keeps coming and say, OK, how are we actually going to make this happen? Um, I mean, you're seeing the, the costs are starting to come down quite a bit on the metal stuff. Uh, you know, the, the desktop printers, the MakerBots and whatnot, their price point is now sort of where laser printers were when they first came out, $1,500, $2,000. You have a great idea for a new one, throw it up on a Kickstarter campaign and you'll get $2 million bucks to create your $300, what do we got, $300 yeah, now yeah, for yeah. this one, you know. Um, so the, the metal 3D printers are at... Uh, probably six, seven hundred k now for for a starting point. We're just saying within the next uh, you know one to two years they'll probably be down to about four hundred, three hundred. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I, I'm thinking time frame that's probably three to five years when metal becomes sort of more mainstream based on what we've seen. And, but but already everybody is now how do I do plastic and conductive and metal and and bio at the same time? I mean, the real scary thing to me we were talking with. Folks at Hershey uh, Medical Center there, and it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, they were dreaming about, you know, being able to 3D print your liver there in the, uh, the operating room, and it wasn't no longer, you know, if we can do this, is when, it was when. And it was anywhere, you know, a 10 to 20 year horizon sort of thing uh, for 3D printing, you know, functional organs and that sort of stuff. So, so the costs are coming down. I think everybody is trying to go bigger and cheaper and faster. Uh, there's sort of always a trade-off, at least now, the, the bigger you go, sort of you trade off the, the resolution with speed to some, some extent, but companies are still tackling that, and I'm sure uh, that's sort of one of the scariest things is tomorrow a new technology could come out that we never heard about, and everything we've been working on the past 3, 5, 20 years is now completely obsolete. So that's both exciting and scary at the same one time. Of our, one of our biggest challenges with metal machines is that the technology is moving so quickly that when you make an investment, 700K or a million dollars, your technology is obsolete in a year. It's like your iPhone. And uh, so we're really hesitant sometimes to make that investment when we know that you know, the iPhone 7 is going to come out next year. Uh, so it's moving quickly. So I, it's a matter of time. But uh, yeah, we're not there yet, obviously. Other questions? Yep. So how, I, I don't understand how with metal that you can print in the same way you could with plastic. I mean, what... Uh, metal, to, to form it, it needs to be hot, right? Absolutely. And yeah, so we're, we're, we had a couple of sample parts going around earlier, and so you're starting out in metal, you either have a, a powder or a, or a wire in some sense, and it's, and it's like welding. Uh, and then you have a laser or an electron beam, basically a high energy source that is literally melting that metal in you. So you have a little melt, melt pool that the laser is create, turn on your laser, creates a melt pool and whatever that spot, you know, it's, it's obviously much smaller than that, 
or whatever that spot size is, is hitting, it is melting that metal. And then you have enough control and precision <coughs> as that. Do it one layer at a time over and over again, and you, you build up your 3D part. So, um, yeah. It doesn't, doesn't metal when you forge it, doesn't it make it, uh, give it qualities that you wouldn't get if you're just printing it? Uh, hence the, the crux of the problem here. <laughs> so from, yeah, how do my properties compare to cast, machine, forged, yeah. you know, all those sorts and, of things. And, and you know, one of the things you do there too is, is, is what can you do after the fact when you print it? How can you post process? Um, you know, hot isostatic pressing certainly comes into play there, uh, as well as many other techniques. What can you do to manipulate the properties so that you can get them back more towards where you wanted them to be, or more in line with what you might get from a forging or another production process? But you're right, I mean, this is, this is one of our biggest challenges. And to answer your question, why we're not there yet, it's, it's certification qualification. That's, that's, that's perhaps the biggest hurdle. We don't, so it amazes me that people are selling million dollar machines and we still don't really know exactly what's coming out of them. That's exactly right. <laughs> I want to be in that business, I don't know, yeah. maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Buy this machine, it'll create a part, but we don't know exactly how it's doing or what it's doing or what's coming out of it, so. Well, and, and to, give you a, to give you more flavor on that, right, the parts that I mentioned the, on, on, on the, the Juno spacecraft, um, the way that we qualified them was by destructive testing. We, we printed lots of additional parts in those same builds, and we, 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 we really tested them uh, to death, so to speak. And so that's, that's not an uh, economical way to do this in the long term. Uh, we found a unique opportunity to do it there, and the business case made sense, we did it. But uh, that's, it's, that, that's just one way to be able to do it, but that's not the solution. Sure. In that bracket that came around, yep. it's got the four mounting holes <clears throat> and then the pivot point on the top. If that pivot point needed to be brass for a bushing, is it possible to 3D print the bracket out of whatever the metal is, and then also with the same passes or the same runs, build the brass bushing to be later just machined out? Or does that have to be all No, one? so there, there, are, there are systems out there that allow you to feed different metals during different steps of the process. So we've got one of our systems here, actually has two powder feeders. And so you can change, oh. uh, as long as the, the powders are sort of compatible, one of the things is they, they heat and cool so much. So if they have different thermal expansion coefficients, one expands a lot and the other one doesn't, they're gonna crack, obviously. And so that becomes a you know, compatibility issue. But as long as you can do that, I could feed in this material here, print it here, change it. And so the, the idea of these functionally graded uh, parts that go from sort of one material, one properties here to you know, a different material and different properties here, but as a single integrated structure uh, is again, something that, that 3D printing additive can do that a subtractive process cannot. Other questions, comments? Okay, one of the things that has uh, struck me in the forecasting uh, method is also the design end. And I, there was a question that was earlier asked, you know, what do you need if you want to bring in a file? Um, a lot of our engineering uh, methods, especially the software, looks at things from a sort of subtractive methodology. And there is a lot of research happening in terms of, well, how do you begin to design for additive manufacture? because it's very different. You can treat your loads uh, in a very different fashion and optimize them. So what is happening in that area? Uh, how, future training, what should students be engaged in or people who are interested in this topic? I think definitely CAD software in general is gonna be a need to know. However, there are softwares that are changing, um, much like Sculpt, which you use a stylus per se. It's called the touch. And what you do is it actually gives you resistance based off of what you are sculpting, as if you're sculpting from clay. Instead of designing in two-dimensionally, it's really what you're looking at before you make it three-dimensional. You now have the ability to sculpt in three dimensions. And I, I, I hope that answers your question as far as that goes, is the ability to get those more organic geometries with ease. I'd, I'd say the first thing you need to do um, when you think about designing with 3D printing is, is think differently. Um, it's, it's a different paradigm. And the best thing you can do to prepare uh, that I can tell right now is get hands-on experience. Uh, 
fail a bunch of times, you know, figure out all the different ways you can get your printer to, to not work, um, because there are many. Uh, <laughs> in fact, most, most, most combinations of parameters will not work. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, something, someone said something to me that was fairly enlightening, and they said, you know, nobody's written the book on this yet. Um, there is not a design guide or design tutorial out there. Uh, we're, all, we're all in the process of doing that right now, whether it's at Penn State or some of the other universities or, or some of the other research consortia. We're trying to figure out well, what is the design methodology. Um, you know, it's hard to say what will result in a failed print. It's, it's hard to know if you don't have any experience where you need to put support structures or what type of geometries and features you can design in. And our workforce is not equipped for this right now. And so what we're trying to do is give as many people as much exposure as possible to the different technologies that are out there. Um, and I just say, you know, that, that hands-on experience, uh, many, many, many failures under your belt really positions you for the most success in the future. So in particular, uh, let me just borrow these for a half second. So if we have these two different brackets, is there any software that is currently being developed or on market where I can say, here's a mounting point, here's my load, here are the forces, and that's all. You don't design the part, but algorithmically, it's created for additive processes. You want to take that one? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm, I'm not an expert in it, but yes, there, there are um, topology optimization software. Um, in fact, I mean, it's been around for a long time. Uh, and so, so you're right, you, you actually hit the nail on your head. You're, the philosophy you're trying to embrace is start with my interfaces, you know, and then where, where are the only places I need to put material for my load paths um, when you're talking about structure. Now, the challenge you get there, right, is you need to know your boundary conditions really, really well. Because if there is another load that you're just not aware of, you don't design it in, you're going to have catastrophic failure. And so now you start asking yourself, well, what are my unknown loads and my, my factors of safety that I need to build? And it becomes very, very challenging. So uh, yeah, there's software that will, will think for you, but it, it's, it's not fire and forget. You still need to think about what the environment is that you're putting that part in. It's um, the unknown unknown. Exactly, it is. So yeah, a funny, a funny story associated with that. So yes, there is topology optimization software that's out there that you tell them what the load conditions are. It tells you where to put material. That's been around 20 years. Right. Like the printer, we now have the technology is finally caught up to be able to make those parts. So it's sort of, uh, there's renewed interest in it. But so one of our 3D printed backets, can you, can you hand me that black one there again? So again, they were, they were very specific in sort of the loading conditions, you know, where it's pulling and this sort of stuff. And our, the, the one that we designed, which is not up here because I broke it, uh, was basically it had very thin structures in it, and there was a natural tendency as it was in your hand, it was a little springy and you, you just sort of squeezed it. And it wasn't designed for that load and it broke. Uh, it's great with the, this yeah. way, but you go this way and snap. And so to your point, yes, you know, there's software to do that, but if you don't know how it's going to be loaded or whatever else, then you know, you're going to get failure some other way. And I, I really think the sort of the design tools, the CAD, the solid modeling is, is really the big bottleneck now. And so having, uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from the, the artists and architects and uh, the sculpting and this sort of stuff that we need to bring into the engineering world and um, you know, my XYZ coordinates and here's my datum and I'm going to extrude and revolve. We need to get way beyond that from what we're doing. Uh, but that, the companies don't like that either because now how do you, you know, how do you set tolerances and specifications on that little lattice structure that's going yes. around to know that you know, each arch is exactly the right size? And the, yeah, and how do you inspect <laughs> it and say, yep, that's a good part. So all of that's getting rewritten too. So it just keeps compounding on itself and, and getting worse and worse as we go. <laughs> <laughs> so related, for, oh, go ahead, you have a question? Uh, so was, was this an actual actual bracket from a functioning machine, or was this a... Because not, not the, the metal version of that was a, an actual bracket that GE used, yes. And it was that, that very shape. And it was that exact shape, yes, sir. Because, because you know, I mean, a bit of milling, I, I think, you know, a, a clever, not even a clever engineer, a structure engineer could, could have <laughs> oh, yeah. been able to calculate it. And, you know, maybe not make it as light, but so we're making absolutely making it half the weight. But and I think to their credit, I don't, I don't, I mean, I think it was more of a, a uh, an engine mounting bracket on a on a test rig, so it wasn't actually particularly oh, right. on an airplane. So they weren't as as concerned about that. Um, but but that's an interesting perspective. And so if you do like a finite element analysis on that part, so traditionally uh, we sort of look at okay the loading conditions, and then we do. Uh, finite elements to tell us sort of what the stresses are and then you get a you get a pretty picture of your structure that says uh, red are high constant hot points high concentration points and blue everything is cool basically very low stress and so now when you actually see that picture on that sort of part 
Blue actually says, you've got too much material there. And so you're interpreting, whereas we're used to looking at that picture and saying, ooh, I've got too much red. We now actually look at it and say, I've got too much blue. How do I use additive to get it out of there? Um, and so can my part, you know, go on a diet and how's it going to lose weight sort of thing? Yeah, what Tim's referring to there, for those of you who are not familiar with it, there's uh, packages in software called finite element analysis where you can run these parts through and put your loads in and it'll give you color gradations where your stresses are higher and lower. But some practical knowledge for those of you who are interested in learning how to model, uh, there is a really interesting new program out there that is actually, you can model on your iPhone or your Android or a tablet as well as a computer. Um, it's by the creators of SolidWorks, which is a really popular uh, engineering program that was developed here in the States, up in Massachusetts, and it's called OnShape, and it's an online uh, modeling package. And I have to say, you know, it's not where SolidWorks is now, but it's pretty promising. I've been playing with it the last couple of days, and uh, I, you know, if you're interested in getting your feet wet, great, great way to do that. And that's a solid modeler. There are also other kinds of modelers called surface modelers, which industrial designers and architects seem to like because it allows you a lot of freedom and you're just playing with surfaces that can have compound curvature. So I think that's what Tim's referring to is this crossover of, you know, where do solid modelers and surface modelers meet? I'm in fact collaborating with an engineer and we're doing that and it's, you know, it's full of um, interesting surprises because engineers like to have parametric constraints which they put in a dimension and then they change something else and another component will change. Well, surface modelers generally don't do that as easily. Um, they can do that. But uh, are there any other questions? I know our time is drawing near. I have a couple of announcements. Yes. I just wanted to ask, uh, your Penn State lab, do you offer any, uh, any tours? Absolutely, yep. So we, oh. we have, uh, I don't know if they're it's sort of on, on demand as, uh, happy to give you an email and we can contact sure. and let you know sure. when things are scheduled, so. Okay, um, thank you. Single individuals? Hmm? Single individuals? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we prefer to do them in groups, but uh, <laughs> I think we had uh, about uh, 20 people going around and four different today just uh, trying not to bump into each other. So so we've been up open over a little over two and a half years, and we've had probably 2,500 visitors in that time frame. So we stay busy. Hmm? Uh, we're out at Innovation Park. Uh, out there across from the, the Penn State or Hotel. The tour is fantastic. I encourage you to, before the donation hat gets passed around, try and right, find yes. a, an excuse to because it's a big hat. Um, okay, so a few announcements. We have a survey, help us make Maker Week better if we go and do this again. It's been a really interesting week for us, and uh, I think that I'm going to twist Glow's arm to do this. They've done a fantastic job. There's been a bunch of other partners in this. You should take a look. If you haven't seen this, this survey, but um, New Leaf, the discovery space, the make space locally here in town is having an event after this. And it's at 141 South Fraser the, under the parking garage. It's that tiny little alley uh, near, near the Alley Cats guitar, if you know where that is. So go check that out. Down in the actual plaza down below, there's going to be like laser graffiti and uh, high voltage, 10,000 volt, uh, Jacob's Ladders, uh, propane synthesizers. It's, uh, these people are not well in the head, and I encourage you to see it <laughs> before the police show up. Um, we have Catalyst Space, which is a make space over in Altoona. They're, they're also doing some great things. We have Justin Merrill here, and he's going to be doing a robotics workshop tomorrow, right? Or a demonstration. I hate to use the word workshop because people think they have to work. No demonstration. You can just go and watch. Uh, an idea gym over at New Leaf from 6.30 to 7.30. And uh, the, the ever-loving singing Tesla coils. It's a sort of barbershop quartet happening tomorrow night. Then on Saturday, there's going to be a really uh, very open community affair in the park. It'll be out here, weather permitting. If not, we'll be inside. But uh, if you make something, bring it. Show off what you're doing. And... Uh, Talk to Nathaniel here, he can get you a table. Um, all sorts of uh, propaganda going out to the press for this one, so it should be a pretty good show. Um, anybody want to add anything? Yeah, um, we've kind of been talking all about the engineering aspect really today in manufacturing, but I think it's important to understand that 3D printing isn't just manufacturing. It's also changing the way we communicate with individuals and how we learn different objects. For me, when I got into 3D printing, and I'm finding this with a lot of people I talk to, is it's making it easier for us to learn. When you can take something from your classroom 
go home and actually apply it and have tangible evidence, it changes the way you think. It also changes the way you, you understand how things are made differently. And I would like to see in the future where we head with that as a form of communication. Think of computers when you, when they were just starting out. I know for me it was a Commodore 64 or, or a Macintosh 2, and now they're in the back of my pocket. You know, where is this technology going to go and how are we going to communicate with it? It is definitely something important to think about. Yeah, Andrew, thanks for bringing that up because the importance of prototyping and exploring creative results, it, it cannot be overstated what these machines can do. So uh, this is one reason why you may think about buying or building, uh, creating one of these little devices. And then if your life isn't complicated or frustrating enough, this is the perfect way to solve that problem. But, uh, no, it really is a lot of fun. All right, well, thank you all for coming and thank you for uh, our speakers here. Thank you.